Hello, this is Mrs. Standridge. I'm here today reading um, Elijah of Buxton. We're going to be reading chapter 10 today. Um, the last couple chapters, Elijah has been um, at a carnival that he's not supposed to be at with the preacher. And we're going to find out um, what else is going to happen to Elijah at this carnival. I think Preacher has probably got something up his sleeve that he wants to try to trick Elijah into doing. Let's find out. Chapter 10, Meeting the Real Maui. Me and the Preacher wandered around the carnival for about another hour. <clears throat> then we walked back into the Atlas Clearing and headed for a tent where most of the carnival workers were sitting. A big, rough-looking white man with bright red hair stood up and put his hand on the preacher's chest and said, Show's over, boy. We's pulling up stakes tonight and don't need no more workers. The preacher slapped the man's hand off his chest and stood so his jacket was open and that mystery pistol was showing. <clears throat> he said, I look like a boy to you. I'm not here about work. I'm looking for the owner. And if you put another hand on me, you'll be pulling back a bloody stump. The tall conjurer man with the two sets of eyes jumped up and said, Hold on a moment, Red. I own this carnival, sir. How may I help you? The preacher pushed past the red-haired white man and said, Sir, I just want to start by telling you what a wonderful carnival you have here. <clears throat> The conjurer reached his hand to the preacher and said, Why, thank you, sir. Whom do I have the honor of addressing? I'm the Right Reverend Deacon Dr. Zephariah Connerly III. A pleasure to meet you, sir. Reverend Connerly, I am humbled to be in your presence. I am the lowly Charles Mondial Vaughn IV, Knight Commander of the Most Honorable Order of the Bath, knighted a mere 14 years ago. Preacher said, I'm the one who's humbled, sir. I've been to many such carnivals and have never seen anything that matches this one. You must be very proud. Indeed, indeed. I've worked years to assemble this family. The preacher said, which is why I wanted to speak with you. <clears throat> the conjurer took a long pull on his cigar and blowed the smoke to the side, then said, and what may I do for you, sir? It's more what I can do for you. I'm intrigued. Do tell. The preacher pulled me from behind him and said, Sir Charles, allow me to introduce the most amazing child ever to have lived in Buxton. Although he was born and reared in Africa, he has lived with me for these past four years. Maybe in your travels you've heard of the tribe he's from, the Chichotes. Sir Charles said, you can't say that I have. <clears throat> There's good reason you haven't. Sad to say, little Abo here is the last surviving member. Well, Reverend, that is indeed sad, but what does that have to do with my carnival? The preacher commenced waving his arms, really warming into this tale he's about to spin. The Chichotes were fierce warriors who hunted and even fished with nothing but stones. Stone throwing was a skill passed from generation to generation, and little Abo's father, who was the king of the Chichotes, passed on the secrets of stone hunting and fishing to his son just before he was tragically murdered. The preacher sounded so heart-busted about this that even I was getting sad for little Abo, and I know that he was me and that there weren't probably going to be a lick of truth in the whole story. Conjurer said, pity that, but wait, do I understand you to be saying that this boy can catch a fish underwater by throwing a stone? The preacher said, if only we were at a lake so he could show you. The conjurer winked at the big, rough, red-haired white man and said, if he can do that, he must have an unusually keen eye. Could he, mayhap, demonstrate his skill some other way? <clears throat> of course he can. I watched your Madame Sabar earlier tonight, and while she was most impressive, I didn't see her doing anything little Abo couldn't match. No? No. Perhaps we could go to her tent and show you. 
Well, sir, we were actually preparing to break things down, but I think little Abo might provide an interesting but brief diversion. The preacher, Sir Charles, and the other white man started walking toward the slingshot lady's tent with me trailing behind. The conjurer looked back at me and said loud and slow, Do you speak any English? It was kind of hard to look at him with his two sets of eyes, but I said, Why, yes, sir, and some Latin, and I can understand a little Greek. Oops, that must have been too much talking. The preacher gave me a hard look, then told the conjurer, Plus, of course, he's fluent in Chichote. One of the conjurer's eyebrows raised up, and he said, Indeed, to my ear, it sounds as if the boy is a very Canadian. That's because not only is he the best stone flinger since David, he's also uncommonly bright. He's lived with me for only four years, and he's picked up the language and customs of Canada West so quickly it's truly astounding. All of a sudden, a stranger boy came up alongside of me and gave me some unpleasant looks. His hair was all matted up like a bird's nest, and his clothes were so dirty that not even Cooter would have been caught dead in them. He said, who you? I just about said my name, then remembered what Sammy had told me about saying Elijah around here. I know the boy weren't from Buxton, and I was pretty sure he weren't from Chatham, but I couldn't be total for certain. I thought it'd be best if I didn't take no chances. He was littler than me, so I said, why you want to know? <clears throat> he said, where y'all going? He sounded American. Over to the slingshot lady's tent. The boy spit, kicked his bare foot at the dirt, and said, I knowed it. I could tell he was sizing me up to see if he could lick me. I puffed my chest up some whilst we talked. The boy said quiet, I's the real Maui. But you's fixin' to take my place, ain't you? What? That white boy warn't no good. I seen it. So now, Massa Charles looking for you to take my place. He tilted his head toward the conjurer and said, He done told me it was just for a whilst was we in Canada, but I knowed he was a lying. Lying about what? You's trying to be the next Maui, ain't you? What? But I'ma tell you right now that you ain't gonna like it. You ain't gonna like roaming about with them one bit. They ain't gonna say nothing at first, but you gonna have to clean all them animal cages and fetch for them all times of the day or night. And the gator man gonna beat you every chance he get and you gonna be cleaning all they clothes. And they stingy with what they feed you. And it ain't even, and it even ain't no fun after a while getting hit in the face with them grapes neither. I said, I'm not taking no one's place. The preacher just bragging on me so the man with all those eyes can see how good I chunk stones. The boy gave me another rough look. I said, you travel around with these people? Of course I do. I told you I'm the real Maui. Your ma and pa travel with you too? I ain't got no ma nor pa. You a orphan? You best watch what you's calling me. What's a orphan? I said, how old are you? I ain't sure. You ain't had no schooling at all? What I need schooling for? You ask too much question. Who takes care of you? Massa Charles do. He look after me good. He done paid more than a hundred dollars for me down in Louisiana. Paid? You're a slave? Nah, I seen how slaves get treated. I ain't no slave. You ain't never tried to escape? What you mean? If Massa cut me a loose, what's I gonna eat? Where's I gonna sleep? But this is Canada. You ain't but three miles from Buxton. You ain't never heard of Buxton? Massa Charles say Buxton why he have to get a white boy to pretend he my wee. He say y'all up here ain't gonna think it funny to see me get pelt with no grapes. Now he seen that white boy ain't no good and he gonna try you next. I told him, my ma and pa ain't about to let me travel with no circus. Buxton's my home. The inside of Madame Sabar's tent looked a whole lot smaller without all the people piled up in it. Madame Sabar herself was sitting on the stage smoking a cigar. 
Ma Wee pointed at the white cloth atop the jungle board and whispered, Can y'all read what that say? I told him, It says the jungles of Sweden. It don't say nothing about Ma Wee? No. That what I thought. He lie. The preacher and the conjurer stopped talking, and Sir Charles told Ma Wee, Go light the candles as if it's a show. Yes, sir. Ma Wee struck a match and set all the candles on the board burning. Them other ones too, boss? Yes, everything. Ma Wee grabbed a lighting pole and went round the tent, lighting the candles up high. When he was done, he came back and said, That all, boss? Yes, Ma Wee, but don't leave. We're getting started in a moment. Yes, sir, boss. Now, Reverend Connerly, perhaps little Abbo can demonstrate his skill. The preacher waved for me to come up on the stage. He whispered to me, First time through, just use your right hand. This warn't going to be nothing. It warn't even twenty paces twixt me and the candles that were sitting atop the Swedish jungle board. I reached in my tote sack and pulled out ten of the chunking stones and set them on the table next to me. I looked at the preacher and he ducked his head at me. I held on to my breathing and chunked with my right hand and passed stones into it with my left. When I was done, all the candles had been put out just as smooth as the slingshot lady had done it. The conjurer and the other white man looked at each other. Madame Sabar blowed a long cloud of smoke out of her nose holes. The preacher winked his eye at me. Ma Wee called out, Hoo-wee! He good, Massa Charles. Y'all can't use him for nothing but tossing stones. He that good? The conjurer said, You're right, Ma Wee. That was most remarkable. Now, how about the others? He pointed at the higher-up candles. This weren't going to be as easy. The farthest candles appeared to be about 30, 35 paces away, and it was dark up that high. <clears throat> the preacher saw I was fretting and came up on the stage. What's wrong? I don't know if I can put out the flames on the two at the back, sir. Just aim to knock them down then. Yes, sir. Just my right hand again? Yes. I held on to my breathing and threw at the twelve candles rung round the tent. When I was done, one of them at the back had got knocked over, and I'd clean mist on the one over the doorway. Sir Charles and the other white man brung their heads together and started talking. Ma Wee said, Massa Charles, Massa Charles, you got to have that boy take over from Missy Sabar. He good enough to take her place. The preacher said, and that's not half the story, Sir Charles. No disrespect intended, madam. But while you are without doubt a deadly accurate slingshotist, little Abbo's skills include something else. The preacher's hands started unfolding and waving right along with the story. He said, One of the reasons the Chichote tribe is now nearly wiped from the face of the earth is that they shared their land with an insect so vile that it is called the horrible giant Bama bee. Bees so large that they've been known to carry away a full-grown man as easily as a hawk carries a mouse. And they attack in swarms of ten, which force the Chichote to learn to throw not only with accuracy, but with speed as well. Might I propose, if she is not too tired, that Madame Sabar and little Abo have a side-by-side -side demonstration that includes speed? Sir Charles said, a race? Why, that might prove to be quite interesting, madam. The slingshot lady didn't look too happy about doing this, but she chomped her teeth on her cigar and stood next to me. The preacher said, <clears throat> If the young boy could light the ten candles on the board again, we can get this started. Ma Wee waited till Sir Charles nodded at him, then lit up all the candles. The preacher said, why doesn't the madam pick one side of the board and put out candles toward the middle, and little Abbo will do the same with the other side? We'll see who puts out the most, the quickest. The woman chomped her cigar harder and said, left. She raised her slingshot. The preacher whispered to me, use both hands, beat her good. He told Sir Charles, you start them. The conjurer man said, both of you start on the count of three. One, 
two folks from Sweden must not be real good at counting. The conjurer hadn't even finished saying two before Madame Sabar put out the first candle on the left. Three. I throwed left, right, left, right, left, right. I'd got six of them in the time she got four. She spit her cigar on the stage and said, Light them candles up again, you little fool. Maui waited on the conjurer to nod, then lit them all up. This time I got seven and she got three. She knocked one of them over, too. She dropped her slingshot and walked out of the tent. Maui shouted, Hoo-wee! He done run her off. He way better than her. You gonna let him take her place? The conjurer said, my word, Reverend, you didn't exaggerate in the least. I think little Abo will fit very nicely into our family. Maui said, he gonna take her place, boss? I ain't never seen no one what throwed so good. Lots of folks pay to see that boy throw. It'd be a waste of time having him get pelt with grapes. The conjurer said, start breaking things down in here, boy. I want to leave by noon tomorrow. Red, go see if Madame Sabar is all right. Reverend, we need to talk. Him and the preacher stood next to the stage. Sir Charles said, I assume you've had some expenses in raising little Abo. I'm willing to give you some consideration for that. You say the poor lad is an orphan? Yes, I'm the only one he has. How much are you looking for, sir? The preacher said, hold on here, you've misjudged me. I don't deal in human beings. Then what is it you're proposing? <clears throat> the boy and I would be willing to travel with you for a while if you're willing to make certain guarantees, such as, such as how much we would be paid, such as what it is we would do in your family, such as what it is we wouldn't do. Sir Charles blowed out another long puff of cigar smoke at the roof of the tent and said, Ah, well, Reverend, what is it you propose doing? I can see that little Abo would be able to carry his weight and contribute to the family with his stone throwing, augmented, of course, by several other chores, but I really do not have a need for anyone else. I would, however, handsomely reward you for your transference of guardianship of the boy. Ma Weed pulled all the candles off the top of the Sweden jungle board. He said, Pardon me, boss. You wants me to take this sign about that white boy off of here? We gonna put it back saying this here's the real Ma Wee's jungle, ain't we? The conjurer man kept his eyes on the preacher but nodded his head at Ma Wee. Ma Wee pulled off the white sheet that said, The Jungles of Sweden. Writ out underneath the sheet in letters direct on the board was, The Jungles of Darkest Africa. Help Madame Sabar capture Ma Wee, the chief of the Pickaninnies. All of a sudden, the preacher was done talking. He grabbed hold of my collar and we marched out the front of the tent. Before you could blink, we're walking down the road back to Buxton. Things happened so quick that I had to ask the preacher, why do we leave without saying goodbye to no one? He said it wasn't what I thought it was. What do you think it was? Why aren't it just a carnival? Forget this happened. It was a bad idea from the start. What was? Nothing, Elijah. I was simply looking for a way to help the settlement. I tried a couple more times, but I weren't getting no more explaining from the preacher. It appeared he didn't want to talk no more which I took at, I'm sorry, which I look at as he wanted to do some listening. So I told him all about Sammy and how scared I was about getting floated away and about how Sir Charles paid a hundred American dollars for my wee. I kept on talking all the way to Buxton, but the only subject the preacher seemed to take any kind of interest in at all was my wee. He had me tell him about it three times. I asked the preacher if you were still a slave, if you didn't mind working for someone and didn't have nowhere else to go. Only thing he said was, yes, you're still a slave, but you're worse than a slave. You're an ignorant slave. When we got home, the preacher waited whilst I climbed in through my bedroom window. Once I got in, I waved at him and he waved back and walked away. 
It weren't till I was in bed thinking about the most exciting day I'd ever had in my life that it came to me that the preacher had headed back down the road to Chatham instead of toward his own home. That was just as peculiar as a whole lot of the things the preacher did that night. I just chalked it up to some more of that groaned up behavior that don't make no sense. It don't make no sense at all. <clears throat> On Monday morning, me and Cooter joined up in front of the schoolhouse. I was about to explode wanting to him, wanting to tell him some more about the carnival, but before I could open my mouth, he said, Don't it seem odd ain't no one else here? Doggone it, all Elijah, the same thing happened to me last month when I lost track of the days and sat out here for a, a half an hour on Sunday morning wondering where everyone was at. Today is Monday, ain't it? Yes, don't you remember sitting in church all day yesterday? So where's every... We both heard someone say, Oh, and walked around the back of the school. All the other children were crowded up in a big circle way out in the field. Wouldn't no one dare fight this close to the school, so me and Cooter ran over to see what the commotion was. I said, I bet they found another dead body. Cooter said, uh-uh, Emma Collins is standing there and she'd have run off and told someone first thing. I bet one of them moth lions from that circus she was telling me about busted loose and they's holding him down till someone comes to get it. I looked at Cooter and couldn't help hoping that thick-headedness ain't something you can catch like a cold. When we busted into the circle, it warn't neither a dead body nor a lion. Twas a little stranger boy standing there looking like he was about to cry. I knowed this boy, but I couldn't get a hold on from where. Then it hit me. Twas a Maui. Somebody had cut all his wild hair off and put him in some proper clothes. I said, you escaped, you're free. Twarn't odd for folks that just got freed to look and act confused, but I hadn't never saw no one that looked and acted like they were mad about coming to live in Buxton afore. And Ma Wee was good and mad. Why, he was pouting and looking like he had rocks in his jaws and was grumbling so as everyone was wondering if he was crazy. Emma Collins asked him, what, you're wishing you hadn't escaped? You're wishing you were still a slave? Ma Wee rubbed his hand over the top of his head like he was still wondering where all his hair was at. I done told you I weren't no slave, and I didn't do no escaping neither. I got snatched off by his friend. He pointed spot on at me. I said, what? After y'all left, your friend come back and stole me from Massa Charles. I couldn't help myself. I knowed I should have kept my mouth shut, but I said, The preacher? Ma Wee said, Preacher? He sure don't act like no preacher I ever seen. Cooter said, What happened? Soon as we got done breaking everything down, that friend of his bust in holding on to two guns and set to pistol whipping Massa Red. Then he grabbed Massa Charles' hair like he about to scalp him. He shoves one of them guns right in Massa Charles' nose. We all thinking it gonna be another stick up and boss is sure fear to this man and say, ain't no need to hurt no one, just take the money. But that there boy's friend, Ma Wee pointed right at me, say he ain't looking to rob us and then he point the gun what ain't jammed up Massa Charles's nose dead at me. He tell the gator man he got one minute to tie my hands up. All the time he got that pistol up in Massa Charles's nose so deep blood running down his face. Tears were pouring out of Ma Wee's eyes. Once the gator man got me roped good, that preacher tell him this here's Canada and folks is free, and he taking me to Buxton and he gonna kill anyone what tries to stop him. Then he tells Massa Charles that once we gets to Buxton, y'all's army gonna make sure don't no one come and try to get me back. He say he got him the fastest horse in Canada tied out in the woods but it weren't going to be no different if he had an old broke-down mule, because he ain't going to gallop him, nor trot him, nor rush him at all. He say he ain't about to run from no one, especially not in his own country. Then he tell Massa Charles the way to come if he want to find where y'all live. He tell him that the road to Buxton branch off to the right about half a mile down, and if they daft enough to follow him and wants to meet the Lord that bad, 
Then that the way they got to turn. Everybody was looking shocked at Maui's story. He wiped his nose on his shirt sleeve and said, then he pulled me out of the tent and tugged me off into the woods and put me on top that pretty horse and tied me to the saddle and tie them reins round his waist and put one of them pistols in each his hands. And we starts walking right down the middle of the road. I just know Massa Charles and them gonna come rescue me and I'm hoping when they kill that man, the aim's good and they don't shoot me by mistake. Maui kicked at the ground and said, only thing I can figure is they took the wrong branch once they come to where the road split up. But don't none y'all be surprised if they come busting in that there schoolhouse and take me back with them. Emma Collins said, why are you wishing that for? You're free now. Maui said, how's I free when they told me I ain't got no choice but to go to school? How's I free when they got that Johnny boy and his mama watching over me like a sheriff? The bell rung, and it came to me that I was going to have to be careful with my wee. If Emma Collins or one of them other girls got wind that I was wandering about past midnight at the carnival, they'd get me stewed up in a world of trouble. As we walked up the steps into the schoolhouse, Mr. Travis said, Good morning, scholars, strivers, and questers for a better future. Are you ready to learn? Are you ready to grow? He saw Maui and said, well, congratulations. They told me you'd be joining us today. Welcome, young man. I could tell being free was going to be a hard road to hoe for Maui. Instead of answering Mr. Travis in the proper way, he, bold as anything, said to him, how many people in y'all's army anyway? Children jumped to the side and cleared out of the way so as not to interfere with Mr. Travis getting a proper snatch at my wee. But Mr. Travis surprised us. He didn't cane my wee, nor scold him, nor buke him in the least. He gentle laid his hand on my wee's head and, without no sting in his voice at all, said, My name is Mr. Travis. When I call on you to speak, you will address me as that or as sir. I have a feeling you and I are going to be spending a great deal of time together. Once again, welcome and congratulations. Maui said, thank you, sir. Both me and him kept peeking out the window all through the day, waiting for Sir Charles and the rough red hair white man to come, but they never did show. All right, so I guess Buxton has a new addition. I think it may, might remain to be seen whether Elijah and Ma Wee become friends or if they remain foes. What do you think? Do you think that Ma Wee is um, right to be upset, to be yanked away from uh, everybody that he knew? Or do you think he's going to be better off to be free and live in Buxton? We'll talk about it tomorrow. Bye.